We started this series with uh, emphasis on prayer. Last week we talked about hope. Today we're talking about prophecy. And we study prophecy so that we can prophesy. The, the idea of prophecy in the scripture is usually, a lot of times when we say the word prophecy, we tend to think of just predicting the future. But that's actually a very small part of what prophecy is in the scriptures. The core idea of prophecy, whether it's predicting the future or not, is it's a message from God. It's someone is a messenger sent by God with a message. And so to provide, to prophesy is to, pro to communicate God's message to someone else. And the reason we have these kind of messages is so that we can live as God's messengers. One of my favorite leaders and authors is John Maxwell. Many of you might still have some sort of a uh, sweatshirt that we made many years ago that has this quote on the back. It's one of my favorites. It says, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. A leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Uh, very similarly is the outline that you'll see in your handout today, or if you're listening online or following along digitally, there should be a digital uh, version of this. But the three things we're learning about prophets or messengers today is this. Messengers hear what God says, do what God says, and share what God says. If you would, say that out loud. Those of you who are here with me this morning, please say that out loud together. Messengers hear what God says, do what God says, and share what God says. Now, a lot of the most powerful prophecies in the scriptures, the ones that I'm the most concerned about, the most into right now, are the ones about the last days. And you probably know this, but just to make sure, the last days in the scripture are all the days between Jesus' birth, death, resurrection, and his ascension and sending us into the world, that era that we celebrate at Christmas time with Advent and all the other things that we do, the time between then and his return. But especially when we talk about the last days, the prophecies, if you will, throughout the scriptures about the very last days, it's, it's about the very, very last days. The, the ones, it's been about 2,000 of our years as we count time since Jesus was on this planet. But there's a day that's coming. There's, there's, a, there's a time when Jesus actually returns. And the closer we get to that, the more those last days prophecies start to really, really look like what's happening around us. And I don't know about you guys, but it's there. I wish we had more time, and we will in the very near future walk back through some of these really, some of these really specific things that we have. Most, I'll tell you this right now. Most of the things Jesus said would happen before his return have already happened. And a few of them seem very likely to happen very, very soon. What we're focusing on today is our responsibility in that. Our responsibility in not only knowing what these things are, but speeding that day along. Here's what Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy, in uh, 2 Timothy 3. Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. And then he unpacks what that means. To be a lover of yourself in the last days means this. They will be lovers of money boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He says that in these last days, these lovers of themselves will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. They have, they're having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. Now, that's a disturbing little phrase right there. But I, I, again, I don't have time to totally unpack it. But I'll tell you, it, the key to understand is the same way that some of the weird things Jesus said. Like, you've got to hate your family to follow him. He doesn't literally mean hate them. It, it, it means you cannot ally yourselves with people who live like this. Of course, you don't just have nothing to do with him in the sense that you ignore them, you're rude to them, you're mean to them, you write them out of your life. It's not like that. But you, you, we dare not make them our closest confidants, the people we get advice from, the people that we do life with. 
We, we cannot, because the closest people to us shape our lives more than just about any other force there is. And we've got to make sure that the people we intentionally surround ourselves with are fellow believers who are also trying to live out God's will right now. A form of godliness that denies its power is any form of godliness that just tries to add some God things into the rest of your life. If you are practicing any form of quote-unquote godliness that's just trying to work it in to the rest, it's one more way you're trying to be a better person by your definition of a better person. That is not a form of godliness that is the godliness that God wants and describes and commands for his people. The power of God is to actually change us, to transform us, and to transform the world around us through him. And the true forms of godliness that God wants us to experience and to share are the ones that change us. Throughout the scriptures, there are these times of 40, these 40 seasons. And one of the main things that they're there for is to give us what the scriptures call ears to hear. Some, most of these times in the scripture that we see the number 40, or sometimes there's seasons, similar seasons that don't use that number. But most of these, and this is why we're using that as a touchstone to kind of lock this in our hearts and, hearts and brains over this season. But most of the time when you see the number 40, it's a negative thing. Most of the time there's some sort of suffering involved or something like that. But not always. We'll actually look at one exception this morning in a second. But what is consistent every single time is it breaks the rhythm. It breaks what's normal. It kind of separates you from what you're used to. During one of these seasons, what seems just the way things are stops for a second. Often it's painful. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not. There's a lot of variables. But when everything stops, we have ears to hear. Even Jesus took intentionally 40 days to listen to God. And here's why. Messengers hear what God says. Would you say that out loud with me? Messengers hear what God says. We have got to keep asking and seeking and knocking. We've got to keep seeking Jesus. We've got to keep asking him for more. We've got to keep expecting him to speak to us and listen and give him a chance to listen. This is why every year at this time we remind each other again, if, as well as other times through the year, but especially at this time, we remind each other to practice whatever spiritual disciplines work best for you to help you connect with God. Bible study, of course, but also meditation, prayer, silence, solitude, fasting. All of these things are ways that we break the rhythms, break through the stuff that we're used to, the day in, day out, all day, all night things that we do that take up all of our energy and time and emotion and, and thought. And we t make a break with those things so that we can have ears to hear the voice of God. You probably haven't heard silence for a while. So here's an idea. Maybe you could just, when you go home today, just shut everything off for a second. Unplug everything. Shut the thermostat off. Shut, you know what? Better yet, go outside and get far enough away from some things that there's actual silence. Get down by the water somewhere and just listen to the beauty of the stillness. And it, I don't know what it is about silence, but that's one way that really helps me to hear the voice of God. It's really hard when there's a bunch of other voices blaring around. Paul wrote this to Timothy, same thing. He says, in these last days, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be faithful. Uh, we're going to need a lot of faithfulness. There's going to be a lot of growing deception that's going to fool everybody. Most Christians are going to fall away from the faith. But as for you, he writes, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Don't miss the emphasis here that he's putting on studying the actual word of God, that the word of God is, is the ultimate source that we have to hear from God. It's the primary way that he speaks to us. It's, it's God interacting with us, breathing in, breathing out. It's a living thing. And yet, 
don't also miss this. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you tried to give someone a message and it just didn't get through. Has this ever happened to you? Maybe you sent one of your kids to go tell somebody else in the house to do something and they never heard about it. Maybe you sent a text and it just somehow didn't get through or the other person forgot their phone. Maybe you leave post-it notes. That happens a lot in, in my house. We leave little post-it notes. Uh, here, here's what I know. It's frustrating when the message doesn't get through, right? Well, where are the post-it notes? We're the ones that God is sending his message through. We've got to make these times to hear from God so that we can communicate clearly. God loves to use tangible, real life people as the way that he communicates. He did this in the Old Testament through the prophets, and he did this ultimately through Jesus. The Apostle John begins both his gospel and his first epistle, reminding us that Jesus was the word of God, the ultimate way that God communicates with us. He was the word of God even before the beginning, even before the creation of the world. He was somehow or another the ultimate embodiment of God's communication with us. In the beginning verses of Hebrews, it says God has communicated with us for years and years in many different ways. But in these last days, he communicated primarily with us through his son. The ultimate prophecy, the ultimate message from God was Jesus Christ himself. And that whole book of Hebrews is just amazing, unpacking the beauty and the power and everything that Jesus Christ has done. By chapter 10, it's ready to start giving us an action. And here, let me say real quick, those post-it notes, I know from experience, and you probably do too, if you find a post-it note hanging on the door or something, it's probably not just saying, I love you or something. My wife is wonderful and she tells me she loves me and I appreciate that. But I know if there's a note on the door, she wants me to do something. And that's how it is with God, too. These prophecies, these messages that come from him, he's expecting us to respond. He's expecting something to happen. And in Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22, it says, Therefore, in light of everything God has done, in light of everything Jesus is, everything Jesus has done for us, therefore, let us draw near to God. Let's take advantage of this opportunity that he's given us by his death and his resurrection and come boldly into the presence of our Father. Now Jesus himself also did prophesy in the sense of he told us some things about the future. Most of the stuff he told us applies all the time or some of it is about eternity. But he did tell us some things. And in your handout are a list of many of those. Mark 13, uh, Matthew 24, Luke 17, many others. I hope you take some time to look through these. Some of these prophecies Jesus made actually came true within a couple of weeks or, or, or months of when he gave them. He sent some people out on mission trips and he said, expect these things to happen. And they did right then. Some of the things he predicted, he, he said these are going to happen in the near future, within this generation, and they did. For example, uh, he said that the temple would be destroyed and not one stone would be left on another. That happened in AD 70. J Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome and the temple was destroyed so badly there was literally not one stone left on another. But uh, some of the things Jesus said are about the very, very last days. And again, this is one of the reasons we're just barely dipping our toes in the deep water this morning because there's a lot of confusion and a lot of even controversy about how to interpret different prophecies in the last days. But here's one of the things that's consistent. You, you should watch th for this and also as you do whatever study you do with whatever sources you do, you need to notice one thing that's consistent. is whether there's any kind of an age after anything or before or in the middle or whatever else however we understand tribulation when Jesus talks about the day of the Lord and when Peter and Paul talk about the day of the Lord they're talking about the very last one they're talking about the end of everything the sun is dark and the moon falls out of the sky everything is done everything is destroyed by fire it's the very very end and this is consistent whatever else happens, whatever you, you understand or believe about that, when Jesus is talking about the very, very end, 
He's talking about the very, very end. Even some of the parables he told are about this. For example, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. You probably heard this one. He said there was a farmer and he planted his fields full of wheat. And then an enemy came and put weeds in among it all. And his servants said, hey, what if we just rip up all those weeds so the wheat will grow better? And the farmer said, no, let's wait. We'll sort it out at the end. And sure enough, the end comes. And the harvest, during the harvest, they separate it all. And like most of Jesus' stories, the good stuff, the wheat, is repre- it represents something that brings good into the world, something that feeds people. It bore fruit. And the bad stuff, the weeds, are things that do nothing good for anybody. They are a waste of time and energy, and they get burned up. Pretty consistent pattern. But then his disciples come in and said, hey, could you, could you interpret this for us? They, they said, could you explain this to us? So he goes, okay, yeah, I will. The, the farmer is God, the servants are the angels, and the wheat are God's people, and the weeds are everybody who's not God's people. And then he says that phrase again. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. If we live as God's messengers, we hear what God says. And I urge you, I pray, I beg you, I dare you, do whatever it takes to make sure that you're hearing what God says. Because that day is coming. And when that day comes, there's no more chances on the other side. When Jesus comes back, the earth will be destroyed and it's done. Not only do messengers hear what God says, they also do what God says. If you would say that out loud with me. Messengers do what God says. And here's here's one of the things that's consistent in prophecy as well. He always tells us just enough that we can do what he says. He always does just enough that we can, we know what we're supposed to do next. I wish that some of the prophecies were a lot clearer. I wish that it wasn't even, there wasn't any room for controversy. It was just like this exactly, and and there's no other way to misunderstand it or understand it. I wish it was. It's rarely that clear. It's usually kind of vague. What's always clear are things like Jesus saying, therefore, always be prepared. Therefore, work hard right now. Therefore, there's always a therefore. We've got to put it into practice. One of the few exceptions to 40 being a painful thing is actually ironically in the book of Judges. If they ever make a book of a movie of the book of Judges, I don't think anybody will be able to watch it. It'll just be too dark and too gross and the rating will be too high and the Christians won't want to watch it because it's gross and the, it, it's, it's just a dark, dark book. But there's also some fantastic stories in there. And if you've read Judges, and I urge you to because it's fantastic, even though it's dark, here, here's something you'll notice. Several times when there's all this chaos from people just everybody doing whatever they see fit, God will send a champion in. And the champion will fix everything. And then there will be 40 years of blessing. 40 years of peace. 40 years where, again, what they've become used to is mass chaos and everything being broken and being pelted by their enemies constantly and punished nonstop. Suddenly there's a break from that. There's a a period of blessing. And as you look back on your life, I hope you had a chance over the Thanksgiving holiday to do this. But as you look back, I hope you can see you've had some of those moments too. We all have these dark 40 moments, but we also have some periods of blessing. If you're like me, though, a lot of times you might look back and realize that you kind of wasted some of those. Those weren't the moments that you were seeking God the most or doing what he wants the most. But when the blessings come as well as in the hard times, I hope that we take time to do that. More about the last days. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching the first sermon that was ever preached to people after Jesus had died and risen and ascended and sent us out to preach. This is it. This is where it started. Acts chapter 2, he's already talking about the last days. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. One of the most beautiful and amazing things that happened in the New Testament and happens now in these last days is that there's not just some old crazy guy on the hill kind of version of prophets. We're all God's 
prophets. We're all God's messengers. We all have the ability to hear from his spirit if we listen and we do what he says. We all have the responsibility to share what he tells us. Peter also consistently goes with this. And like Jesus, when he speaks of the last days, he compares it to Noah's flood. Last week we looked at how Jesus did that. Here's how Peter did this. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. And keep, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Don't miss those two awesome ways that we're supposed to anticipate his coming. We look forward to it and we speed its coming. How do you do that? By obeying him and by sharing the truth. Since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Therefore, again, there's always a therefore. If we have a message from God, there's a reason it's there for. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Another wonderful passage, a prophetic passage from Paul, is 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about Christ's return. He's talking about our new heavenly bodies. It's where that wonderful passage is about death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? He also writes this. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Peter again. The end of things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude, excuse me, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever. And ever. True prophets do what God says. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, there's so many of the prophetic passages that are just so beautiful and so powerful. Most of them point to Jesus. All of them were specific things God spoke through specific people for specific reasons, just like the messages we're talking about today, just like our lives. In fact, one of them, Isaiah, not only did his book itself, the scrolls that we call now the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, not only were those so powerful in themselves, he kind of came to represent all of the prophets. And so people would say things like, as written in Isaiah, and it wasn't even Isaiah who said it, but it just kind of, Isaiah kind of represented all that. But I think it's interesting, at least, to notice that in the mountain of transfiguration, when Jesus was transformed into his glorified body and some of his disciples got to see that Moses and Elijah showed up not Moses and Isaiah I don't really know why the Bible never 100% explains that but here's here's one of my guesses Elijah doesn't even have a book but he's known for, but he's known for getting stuff done about Elijah was he was somebody who sought God and he was another person who went up on a mountain was with God 40 days and 40 nights. I think that might be significant. 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
As we start to wrap up this morning, we're about to see one more huge truth and, uh, and a challenge I want to give you. But please don't miss this. Please don't let me lose you wherever you are. You've got to hear this. There's some really practical stuff here at the end. And one of those is this. There are two ways to know if there's someone is a false prophet. One is, obviously, if they give a prophecy and it doesn't happen, it's obviously not a message from God because God is never wrong and God doesn't lie. But sometimes if you make a prophecy and maybe it's five years out or something like that, you'd have to wait a long time to see if that person is really a false prophet or not. Here's the other way to know. If they do what God says, are they living it out? I'm thankful my dad reminded me to share that with you this week. I might have forgot. That's such a powerful truth. But false prophets are people whose lives don't express the same message as what they are saying. That's why the writer of Hebrews, same chapter 10 that we just read through from a second ago, says this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. If we live as God's messengers, we will hear what God says and we will do what God says. But we also, don't miss this part, we also share what God says. I mean, that's kind of the gimme idea of what a message is about, right? You're supposed to say it. You're supposed to share it. Share this with someone, of course. But sometimes that's the hardest one. And for some reason, we just don't get around to that one. For some reason, it's easier, whether it's through things like Advent or whatever, it's easier to find ways to hear from God or even to obey God in our own lives than it is to create ways, find ways, do whatever it takes to actually share the truth, not only with our words, but with our lives. But we've got to be intentional about this, to be God's message messengers, to be God's prophets in this last day's era. We have got to share the truth. With the whole world. Even back in the Old Testament, Isaiah said, uh, turn to me and be saved. These, These are God's words through Isaiah. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. This message is not going to reach the ends of the earth unless we take it there. Another one of the great prophets that I really loved in the Old Testament was Ezekiel. I hope that you go back and reread Ezekiel. The whole book is great, but especially chapters 3 and 37, sometime this week, maybe today. In chapter 3, God is calling Ezekiel, and he lays out three scenarios for what's going to happen if, if Ezekiel gets some messages from him. He says, here's what's going to happen, Ezekiel. First thing, this is the dream. I'm going to give you a message for people. You're going to take it to them. They're going to repent and respond. And they're all going to be saved. And you get to be part of that equation. You did what I told you to do. And they're all saved. That's the dream. But there's two other scenarios. Second one is this. You're going to do what I told you. You're going to take that message to them. They're going to reject it. They're not going to do what I want them to do. Well, in that case, they're still going to die in their sins, but I'm not going to hold you responsible because you did what I told you to do, Ezekiel. I gave you a message, and you took it, and you presented it, and you lived it. Good job. You're off the hook. The whole guilt is on them. But there's one more scenario. He said, here's the other thing. If I give you a message and you don't give it to them, then they're going to die in their sins, and the blood's also on your head. Because you didn't do what I told you to do. And that's why they don't know. That is a scary passage, y'all. But that's also speaking to us today. There's hope in there, though. Ezekiel is also the guy that chapter 37 is that beautiful vision of the valley of dry bones. And that's always what God is about. That's always his heart. It's bringing what's death to life. Bringing what is broken and healing, creating healing in that. To take what is dead, make it alive. To take what is broken, make it whole. To take what is bad, make it good. And fully equip us and fully prepare us so that we can get his job done. Probably the worst prophet, in my opinion, he is absolutely the worst prophet, was the prophet Jonah. And by the definition, just a few minutes ago, I would would even call him a false prophet. 
The things he shared were true, but he did not live it. Now, I, I just got to be honest. We're, we're right here at the end. Please, please keep listening. This is so important, but I, I got to share part of it. I, if I'm totally honest, with, I'm a little bit jealous. Because I, I hear from God, I seek him, and I give him a chance to hear, to talk to me, and I do hear from God. But the way Jonah hears, he doesn't even want to hear from God, and God's like, Jonah, go into Nineveh. He, talk, he just talks to him. He interrupts whatever else he's doing, ignoring God. He just talk. Man, I'd love God to do that to me sometimes. And I'm like, hey, why don't you talk to me like you talk to Jonah? So he kind of irritates me a little bit. But even worse than that, here's the thing. This guy is amazingly gifted. He's incredibly gifted. Even with his bad attitude, God uses him to share this simple message with Nineveh and the entire place repents and comes to God. And yet, the whole time, his attitude is on another planet than where it's supposed to be. The whole time, he's mad at God for calling him. He doesn't just not get around to it. He runs as far away as he can. He tries to get himself killed rather than obey God. He makes God jump through all kinds of hoops just to get him to obey in the first place. And then when he finally obeys, he, he's mad that God actually uses him. He's mad that God blessed him and his talents and his obedience. He's upset that God does it. And the book ends with him pouting on the side of a hill that God had saved an entire nation through him. His life, his attitude, his heart, everything about him doesn't match the truth of what he was proclaiming we dare not be that person two last verses in a challenge romans 12 verse 6 paul writes we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us if your gift is prophesying then prophesy in accordance with your faith in this case it's clearly talking about people who have a gift that to speak a gift to speak on god's behalf but remember that Romans 12 is a passage we spent a lot of time in recently and that there's a lot of different gifts. Maybe your gift is speaking, then speak. Maybe it's uh, serving. Maybe there's all kinds of gifts, but we all have to be prophesying. We all have to be sharing God's message, not only with our words, but with our actions. Hebrews 10, again. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Again, we've got to, in these last days, we've got to make sure that we do whatever it takes. However, whatever we need to do, we need to be willing to try to stay connected to God and each other. We know several will fall away, many will fall away. But those who endure to the end will be saved. We know that it's our job to not only do what it takes to hear from God, but to obey him and to share that truth with our words and with our lives. And that's the challenge I want to leave you with this morning. In a second, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of commitment. But this is what I'm asking you to do very specifically. I'd like you to pray these prayers and I'd like you to write this down or at least just make a mental note. Do something so you act on this tangibly. Number one, here's the prayer. Lord, I, to hear you, I will fill in that blank. For example, I will fast in a certain way this week. I will pray. I will meditate. Maybe you, I will join that 40-day challenge, the YouTube video devotions and praying that God will show us as a church how he wants us to focus on the world more than ever before, focus on sharing the truth more than ever before. But do something tangible so you can hear the word, the word of God. Do whatever it takes. Second, Lord, to obey you. Lord, to obey you, I will put something tangible there. Maybe there's something you know he wants you to do and you've been putting it off. You're going to get it done this week. Maybe there's something you've been doing and you know he wants you to stop. Make it stop. Make that choice. Make that break this way. Lord, to obey you, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Third, finally, Lord, I will speak the truth in love to, and I need you to write a name down, a real person, not just someone, not just the lost, not just people at work, a real name, a person, someone you're going to tell the message to. You're going to share 
with words and with deeds, you're going to speak the truth and love to these people. If we hear, we obey, and we share the truth, then we are the messengers God wants us to be. The other thing that we always do at the end of this time of every service is we offer an invitation to make some sort of public um, decision. And I, I, I'd invite you to do that today. If there's some, you do, even if you just need prayer, but there's something you need to do publicly, we invite you to do that, to give your life to Christ, to officially join the church, anything at all. Uh, we invite you to make that choice. But let's all make a choice to do these things, to be God's messengers as we stand and as we sing.